Welcome everyone to this Excel Nerds tutorial. This is an intro to Excel, so if you already have knowledge of advanced functions and formulas, this probably won't be very useful to you. If you're looking for that refresher course or that intro to Excel, this could be the course you need. We're going to start by taking a look around the Excel workbook because it's a lot of information to really take in the first time you use Excel. By the end of this lesson, we'll move on to some more advanced features and you should have a very firm foundation in Excel. When you open a file in Excel, it's called a workbook. When you open Excel for the first time, it's hard to even know where to start. So let's start at the very beginning. The first thing I'll point out in our workbook is the menu along the top. These different tabs provide us uh, shortcuts to do most of the common things we need to do in Excel. The Home tab is going to be where you start off. You can format text, format numbers, there's conditional formatting, which we'll talk about later, insert and delete rows. A lot of the very basic things you're going to be doing almost every time you use Excel. The Page Layout tab is where you might come to format your worksheet before printing it out and sending it off. The Data tab is where we can pull in data from external sources. We can filter our data do some neat things with text to columns and removing duplicates and data validation. We can even do what if analysis and forecasting. The rest of the tabs allow us to do things like spell check, uh, translate, add comments, view our workbook in a different layout. Um, the developer tab you can enable or disable can be used to record macros, which is a more advanced um, part of Excel that we probably won't cover in this tutorial. Just below these different menu items, this entire row of icons that you see is collectively known as the ribbon. They're all the icons you can use to access all these features of Excel. So what the makers of Excel have done is try to figure out what are the best shortcuts to provide people to create the best experience and you know what things are people using over and over again that they need quick access to. And that's pretty much what they've put up there for you to click on. However, there's almost always more fine tuning you can do once you really dive into any one feature of Excel. So to access those other features, you can click this little icon right here on the bottom right of any of these panes, and this box will pop up, allowing you to fine tune any of the features you're working with. Once you get going in Excel, you might even wanna collapse this because it does take a fair chunk of real estate on your page. So to do that, you would just double click that, it collapses, to get it back down, double click it again, and there you go. This right here is the formula bar. This is where we enter in the functions that are built into Excel to get the answers we're looking for. Down here, this entire thing we'll call the worksheet area made up of millions of cells. You can actually go down a million rows, or just over a million rows, and over 16, about 16,000 columns, I believe, are available for you to use all the way to the right. You're very rarely going to need to use that much room, but it's good to know that all that real estate is there for you. So the building block of any worksheet is the cell, and right here I'm in cell A1. We'll actually talk more about how to build your data sets, how to insert or remove rows or columns, moving around your data set and get into all the nitty gritty, but the building block of a worksheet is a cell. That's what you're going to be navigating through. Down here, there's a toggle bar you can use to get around your workbook. You can also use keyboard shortcuts like I'm doing now. I'm pressing control right, and I go all the way to the right of the workbook. Control left goes all the way back. Control down goes all the way down, and so on. If you're on a Mac, the same thing would work using command plus the arrow keys. So last but not least is the quick access toolbar found at the top left of our workbook. Now this is a very cool feature of Excel because in addition to providing some of the most common things like saving your workbook, undoing something, or creating a new workbook altogether, you can actually add in the buttons that you might want to see up there. Notice I click save and it took that off of my toolbar. I click it again and there it is. The next thing we'll look at is the different types of data that Excel works with. You're going to be entering a lot of different types of data into your workbooks and sharing these with a lot of people. So you want to make sure that 
Excel understands what you're inputting into the workbook and the people that are receiving this understand what you're working with. The first type of data you'll work with is text. So that's things like names and cities. Column A is an example of text data that we're working with. There's also currencies and comma style formatting you're going to be working with too. You want to show your end user what is just a number that you're showing them and what is currency. I can apply some quick formatting to this column here to very easily distinguish the sales data from the number of calls made. Notice I used the quick access toolbar help box up here to do that. So very quickly we've made some changes to this data that show our end user really what they're looking at. The next type of data you'll run into is Boolean data. That is to say true or false. Sometimes we just need to know whether something is true or false. This will become very, very important when you start building advanced functions and formulas. In our case, we're just looking at whether or not each of these salespeople met their sales goals. And in this case, it was just selling at least $15,000 worth of product. And it looks like only two people did that. And at first, this may seem pretty obvious that numbers are different than text and they're different than Boolean values like true and false. But depending on what type of value the cell is formatted as, Excel will try to do a different thing to it. So it's really important that you understand how your cells are formatted because Excel is going to treat each type differently. The last bit of data you'll notice is a little strange. It's a date. And you might be wondering why a date is 27,709. Well, as it turns out, Excel calculates a date based on the number of days since January 0, 1900. There really is no January 0, but January 1st, 1900 has the date number 1. To prove that, I'll type 1 over here in this box. Actually, that, that cell was already formatted as a date, so we can see that that is January 1st, 1900. Let me remove the formatting so you very, very clearly see I was talking about. So formatted as text, this will actually appear as the number one. If I press control one and then format it as a date, it will change back to January 1st, 1900. So when you see 27,709, that is Excel's version of some date. and that date turns out to be November 11th, 1975. While we're here, I'll show you a quick trick for resizing columns that end up being too small for the data they're holding. Imagine we just opened our workbook and we see this. We know our data is there, but something's wrong. When you see these uh, pound signs like this, all that means is that the column is too small to hold the data that it has. If we hover our mouse above this divider line and drag it over we can see the rest of our data let me undo that there's another way to do that just by double clicking and it will auto size based on the amount of space that it needs in addition to that you can select all five columns double click it and it will auto size all of them at once if you're working with an even larger data set say 50 columns and a thousand rows you can actually click this little button here and it will select the entire workbook and you can double click any of the columns and it will auto size to fit the data. You can also do the same thing with rows, extending and narrowing the width. If you need to double click it, the same thing will happen with the row. In my experience, you'll more often have to resize the columns than the rows, but just so you know, they're both available to you. You can also just as easily insert or delete columns and rows. Say I wanted to insert a column that represented the branch that each employee worked at. I could add it to the end here, but just for the purposes of this tutorial, I'll insert that here by right clicking on the column and then clicking insert branch. And let's say they all work at the west branch. Then to auto size that down, I double click and there we go. To add a row, I would do a similar thing by selecting the entire row by clicking this, by clicking the number on the row, right click, insert, and then we insert the data for that employee. 
If I wanted to hide rows or hide columns, I can also do that by selecting the columns I want to hide, clicking that. Same method to unhide them. I can also do the same thing for rows. Let's quickly take a look at the formula bar and how it interacts with our data as we're inputting it. If I type in a simple formula like sum and then select C2 to C10, we're going to get the sum of the number of calls made for this data set. So as you can see, the formula is up here so I can see what I typed into that cell and the result along with any formatting I've applied is in C11. Once I type this in, I can actually drag this formula over so that it fills the cell next to it. Let me delete this so I can show you how it works the other way. If you click on a cell, you'll see this small box in the bottom right. If I hold that, I drag that over, and there we get our result. What Excel has done is just apply the exact same formula, but move the cells that it references one column over. So as you can see, in this formula, we're referencing B2 to B10, and Excel intuitively knows to go C2 to C10. The next topic we'll cover is series, both ordered and repeating, and how Excel can actually autofill patterns that show up in your data. Excel is very intuitive as far as picking up what's happening in a set of data. Oftentimes you'll have to you know, start off a data set in a very ordered way, but instead of going by hand and say filling this down a hundred times, Excel knows to continue this pattern going down and will do so if you drag the bottom right box of the cell down. Let me do that again. So I select, if I select just the bottom number, it doesn't necessarily know to continue the pattern. But if I select at least two cells and then click the bottom right box, I drag that down and the pattern continues. Excel will also do the same thing with months because dates follow a very logical repeating pattern. So if I highlight these two, Excel will continue the pattern and then start back over January. If we're actually putting in the year as one of the parts of a date, Excel will pick up on that as well. So imagine we're doing January 1st, 2016, and then the next piece of data is February 1st, 2016. Excel will pick up the pattern and go into the next year. As you can see, we get this error here. Again, this is just showing us that we don't have enough room in our column to show all the data it wants to show. So if we double click on this, the problem is solved. Excel can even pick up on some more unusual patterns. In this example, the numbers are increasing by three and Excel immediately picks that up and continues the pattern. So I hope this shows you that Excel is very intuitive at picking up patterns, especially when you're dealing with very organized sequential data, but it could even pick up patterns that are a little unusual. So if you're in a situation when you have, where you have to build out a big data set or autofill something down, try using this feature to see if Excel picks up on the pattern first. Next, we'll talk a little bit about cell referencing and using the autofill with formulas. If you look at this model, it's a compound interest model. There's 29 periods that we have in a list. We want to figure out how much the initial value will grow if every single period it grows by 10%. So let's increase this a little bit to 100. And we can see that by the second period, it's 110. Because this is referencing B2, when I drag this down, Excel knows to then reference B3 and then multiply that by 1.1. So it's moving the referencing down in proportion to how I'm moving down the list of cells. As I move down, you can see it still maintains that same relationship. And I can even autofill this so that it goes all the way down the list. If we want to clean this up a little bit, we can select the entire thing, click comma style, much better. The next example we're looking at is a simple net profit calculated by the sales price minus the product cost, E2 minus D2. If we drag this down, the same thing happens where Excel maintains that relationship that you established in F2. If I double click the bottom here, 
it auto fills the formula down and to clean up this formatting a little bit I can select the entire column click accounting number format much better so the next thing we're going to do in Excel is start moving around the large data set selecting things cutting things copying and really looking at what Excel can tell us about this data set even before we finish all of our formulas so here we have a set of data with a part number the order cost to us the retail cost and the number of those items sold this month there is one glaring thing missing and that is the net profit per item we need to calculate that in order to figure out which item made us the most money this month so to do that we type equals C2 minus B2 pretty simple and that gives us the net profit for that part number as we learned before we can double click this button at the bottom of the cell and that will auto fill that all the way down to the bottom so as we're looking at this new column of data we have there's a cool feature of Excel that actually allows you to learn a little bit about a set of data even without any other functions or formulas so if I draw your attention to the bottom right corner of the lower status bar you can see that Excel automatically calculates the average the count and the sum of our data for us so the average is obviously the total of this data set divided by the number of items the count is just the number of items we're looking at and the sum in our case is actually the total net profit which is six hundred and fifty eight dollars so to confirm that we can go to h2 here type equals sum and six hundred and fifty eight dollars is confirmed so let's really dig in here and figure out which product gives us the most net profit per sale to do that I'm going to filter this data set by clicking the data tab and then the filter button once I do that I can click this button right here and sort the data largest to smallest so I can immediately see that part number 1008 gives us the highest net profit per sale next let's calculate the total amount of net profit by multiplying the net profit times the number sold now that I have that calculated I can do some quick formatting clean that up and then I'm going to do the same thing with column F to figure out which item gives us the highest total net profit I go to the data tab click filter and then sort largest to smallest and it's still part number 1008 some of the other values have changed based on how many of each item were sold but we know that part number 1008 and 1034 those are our best selling items and those are going to deliver the most amount of money month after month now let's do some cut copy and paste from this data set so we have the we have the part number cost retail amount number sold so we have all this data let's say we wanted to copy this to a new tab because we're going to add more information to this tab but we want to have like a backup copy in case we need it later to do that we can go up to a1 and select this entire block right click come up to copy down here to new sheet click that right click here and we have a few options for paste the first thing we can do is paste it as is and that will keep the formulas that we have intact I'm going to undo that Com that's control Z to undo if I right click again and come to the second one that's paste values and that actually erases the formulas that we had already created because in some cases we don't want to keep the formulas we just want to know the values but let's say I only wanted to copy the part number and the total net profit just those two columns I'm going to use some keyboard shortcuts so get ready in a1 I press shift control down let go of shift and then select column F now both columns are selected then press control C they're both copied come over to sheet 8 right click paste values and I've pasted only the part number in net profit 
if you're still working on the keyboard shortcuts, you can always select all of column A by clicking the top tab here, holding control, and then clicking column F, right clicking, copy, go over sheet eight, right click, paste values, and we get the same result. In some cases, you can run into trouble by selecting the entire column and then copying it over. But in this case, we're working with just a very small data set, so it's okay. The next thing we'll do is look at some data that we need to clean up in Excel using some of the text formatting features that Excel has. So here we have data for 2016 and 2017, and we just need to clean this up a little bit so that we can present this to someone at some point. So here you can see I've already gotten started by merging these cells together. Let's undo that. If I select all four of these cells, I can press Merge and Center. That will center it on top of all of these and give it a little bit more of a professional look. Next thing we'll do is add a bit of a border. Let's see here. So that's, we're getting somewhere. Next, we'll format the actual numbers inside of our table. We have a couple of different data types. The first is sales, so these three we can use accounting formatting that looks good for taxes let's try the percentage that's good and for net profit we'll use accounting format but let's also make this bold at the bottom here maybe even give it a double bottom border so let's actually add there's a way you can add a thick bottom border bottom border yeah so that's that's gonna look good in a second so now that we have this we can actually copy all of this and use what's called the format painter to apply it to a section of data that's the same size so let's click that and then highlight everything here and boom it's all good as you remember these pound signs show up when we don't have enough room in our column so we'll double click that and everything looks good if I undo that for one second at formatting. I can use the format painter as a one-off tool, say one cell to one cell. If I go like that, click the format painter, and then apply it to that, it will work just the same. But in this case, I have two sets of data th that are the same size, so it's very convenient. The last thing I'm going to do here is remove grid lines. The grid lines are the lines around the cells that we see in every workbook. In this case, we don't really need to show the formulas or the actual data crunching that went into calculating all of this data, we just need to make it more presentable for the final person that's going to see it. So if I go to the View tab and then unclick Grid Lines box, now we have this nice clean layout that we can present to a manager or our boss or who's ever receiving this data. If you know that you want to copy over everything from a certain tab, you can also copy the entire sheet by right clicking on the sheet name clicking move or copy, and then selecting the place in which you want to copy it to, and then selecting create a copy. This will create a copy of the tab with the same name with the number two around it, but you can always right click and then rename it. So now we're gonna use some conditional formatting and do some data analysis on our data set to really draw out some insights. We're back in our data set with the part number and the total net profit associated with each part. And we're going to really figure out what are the most profitable products and how can we show that easily to the end user. The first thing we'll do is use conditional formatting to visually show which parts sold the most number that month. We could do a filter in which we filter the data like that. But assuming we wanted to show it visually, we could use conditional formatting. So to do that, I select this column of data, go to conditional formatting, and then I'm going to go to color scales and click green to white. So what we've done here is essentially attribute green to the highest values and then a gradient down to white and white is associated with the lowest values. So very easily we can see that parts number 1011 and 1012 have sold a lot during this month. Another cool feature of conditional formatting is data bars. So let's see how that looks. If I go to conditional formatting down to data bars. 
this will associate larger bars with the higher values and smaller bars with the smaller ones. Since we don't have a big range in our data, this looks kind of wonky. If we were dealing with um, a data set that was spread out in a much bigger way, I think it would be visually interesting to look at a data set this way. So I'm going to undo that. Another thing we can do is highlight cells based on certain criteria. If we want to know how many parts sold more than 15 in a month, we can do that as well. To do that, I go to highlight cell rules and then greater than, click on that. So I'm going to choose 15. Excel already has some pre-filled in options for me. I can also choose a custom format, but in this case, I'm just going to click green fill with dark green text. And here we can immediately see which items sold more than 15. Now I'm going to go over to the total net profit column and apply some of the same conditional formatting to see how it looks. So if I apply conditional formatting to that column, it's immediately obvious that part number 1008 is the highest value. And what's interesting about conditional formatting is that the scale in which it goes from green to white is proportional. So we can tell that 864 is a lot bigger than even the next value because if, if there was another value, say 855 or 835, the green would not get so light so quickly. So we know that 864 is a huge outlier in a good way because we sold a lot of that product. Let's try data bars. So right here, I'm actually applying two different kinds of conditional formatting. This might happen to you as you're working through your visualizations. Uh, to manage these rules, you just select the, the data you're working with, go to conditional formatting, and click manage rules. I want to delete the graded color scale, so we're not looking at both. So I highlight that, click delete rule, apply, and come back, and now I'm only looking at data bars. So again, it's immediately clear that 1000, part number 1008 is a huge win for us. So this might be a better way to visualize the total net profit when you finally present this to someone. And again, you can always go to the view tab and remove the grid lines to just show them the data set itself and not necessarily all the cells along with it. There's also things like tables and pivot tables and you know dashboards that you can make as well that would even simplify this data even more but I'll talk about those in another video. I'm going to go into my conditional formatting again and delete these rules. Then I'll come back to net profit and apply conditional formatting based on being less than let's say 300. Say we wanted to highlight what the losers were. We see that we had a lot of losers. If our target was to sell at least $300 net profit of each product this month, we know that we had a lot of losers. So if we undo that, let's highlight only the winners. Let's say our criteria again was 300. We highlight cells that are greater than 300 and fill them with green text. And here are the winners. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, remember to subscribe to Excel Nerds on YouTube so you don't miss any future videos.